This here is my latest purchase and newest project I'll be working on. It is a Hobbytown E7 diesel made in the mid-50s. I believe this is the second version of the kit based on some of the features, which I'll be going over in a little bit here. And it comes with the huge Pittman DC-91 motor. So for this video, I'll be doing a full restoration of the thing, as well as a repaint of the body. And also be giving you a little review and some history on the E7 kit from as far as I've been able to find. The Hobbytown E7 would start out as just a basic body and truck side frame kit. It was up to the modeler to add wheels, a frame, or even a motor and drive system if they wanted a running model. It wouldn't be too long though before Hobbytown would create a full power chassis for it, and I believe this was the first version of what would become their famous and extremely reliable power chassis that we all know now. now this was a heavy model, and they wanted it to be as powerful and smooth running as possible. So they decided to squeeze in the largest motor that they possibly could and found that with just a minor modification to the motor they could fit a Pittman DC-91 in there which was always thought of as an O-gauge motor up to that point. The DC-91 was of course more powerful than any other motor in HO scale at the time and with its 7-pole armature it was very smooth running and combined with their drive system that had all metal gearing it was a very smooth and reliable running chassis, and in the January 1951 issue of Model Railroader, it got very high marks for its performance, being the best running model that they had ever tested at the time, with the eight-wheel drive upgrade. The base kit only had the rear four wheels driven, with the front truck being a dummy truck, and you had to buy the upgrade kit for it. Now the total cost of an eight-wheel drive E7 kit was $30.45, which may not sound like too much, but when you count inflation into today's dollars, that is about a $300 kit. So that was a pretty good chunk of money for anyone who was buying one of these, but at the time, it was the best running model out there, so it was likely worth the cost to those who were buying it. Hobbytown also offered a weight kit to give it some extra traction, and this was an especially nice upgrade for the four-wheel drive option. And for this original power truck, it did have the gearing on the inside, but because of the way the gears were mounted, it had a pretty wide swivel angle, which could put quite a bit of stress onto the drive tubing going to the motor. So going around curves, you might see a bit of a slowdown, unless things were really, really tuned well. Now, only a couple years later, maybe a few years later, Hobbytown would redevelop the trucks and create the second version of their kit, which is the one that I have here. This still had the slightly modified DC-91 motor, but it was now a full 12-wheel drive kit. And because of the new truck design, the tower gears now had to be on the outside of the truck. And this blocked mounting the coupler to the original location, so they had to flip the chassis around to put the gears in the front and the motor was now in the back of the model. Now instead of the frame, they decided to mount the coupler to the truck on this model so that it would run a bit better around the tight curves of the new snap track options available. A couple more years later, Hobbytown would redevelop the frame so the couplers were now mounted to the frame and this allowed the power truck to be moved to the back of the engine again and the motor to the front. Also at this time, they brought out their DC-90 motor, which was a bit smaller than the DC-91 and quite a bit cheaper. And they brought out an 8-wheel drive option again to save a bit of extra cost over the 12-wheel drive. Now this 8-wheel drive model with the DC-90 motor was only $19.95 instead of the $20.95 that they were now charging for the premium version. $10, again, that doesn't sound like too much of a savings to us, but again, counting inflation, that's about $100 cheaper just for the slightly smaller motor and two less axles driven. So quite a significant savings there. 
And this cheaper model, where the, the premium one has brass wheels throughout, the cheaper ones usually had plastic wheels for at least half of it. Sometimes it could even be seven plastic wheels and only five metal wheels. Now, I don't know how long production of these specific versions continued because that much information just isn't available that I can find. Eventually, both of them would be discontinued, most likely around the same time, and Hobbytown would again redevelop the chassis, this time with the smaller Pittman DC-77 motor, and they would add the one-inch flywheel near the front of the chassis, and they would also take out the 12-wheel drive option, as far as I'm finding in the catalog, so it was eight-wheel drive only with the middle axle in each truck as a free-floating axle. They would also go on to use the new universal system instead of the drive tubing that they had always used before. So that part was a pretty good upgrade at least. This version of the chassis is actually still in production today and you can even get it with an open frame motor similar in size to the DC-77, closer to a DC-70 if you want to go for that option. And I believe Hobbytown also has two different gearing options available. There's the there's the 11 to 1 or 12 to 1, which you would usually match to the more modern CAN motor. Or you would use the slower speed 21 to 1 option with that high speed open frame motor. Both run very well, but of course the 21 to gearing is going to be a bit noisier. As for the body, I believe this was discontinued sometime in the 70s. For a long time, it was the only E7 body on the market, outside of maybe a brass model here and there. Eventually, Cary Locomotive would introduce their E7 body to fit Hobbytown's chassis, and it was quite a bit better scaled, had sharper, finer detail around, so it would become the body of choice for those wanting the best detailed model that they could get outside of brass. Also, sometime in the 70s, or maybe it was the 80s, Roco would develop their E7, which was sold by Model Power. That also had a pretty nicely scaled body, as well as a smooth running chassis. So eventually, it's likely that most were going to purchase those instead of Hobbytown's original older body, so there just wasn't much more reason to make it, so it was discontinued. I've talked with the new owner of Hobbytown, who's told me that the molds for the E7 have been lost. The previous owner of Hobbytown doesn't know where they are either, so at this point it's looking like the Hobbytown body will never be made again. But we do at least have the chassis, and it can be used under practically any E-unit body. So to start, I'll be working on the chassis. Looks like this has had some minor changes done over time, like at the bottom here. I don't think Hobbytown was using these universals yet by the time this kit was made. Instead, it would have been drive tubing with a shaft in between. It might have been a one-piece or a three-piece telescopic shaft, which just had like a two-piece in the middle. And then up here, the drive tubing has obviously been replaced because Hobbytown's tubing was black and a little more stiff. So to start, I'm just going to do some quick disassembly here so I can get to all the different parts. So first up will be the universal, and not by choice. Second will be to take off the gear tower here, so that's just two screws. Pull that off, and now one screw for each of the trucks. And looks like they put a piece of tape here to try and mask against a short circuit, which I will check out later. Now one more screw for the motor, and this screwdriver is too small, so let me grab a different one. That screw was in there pretty tight, but I think it also had a little adhesive from that tape in there too. Now that's out, so I can 
Should be able to lift out this motor. There's some washers stuck in there in certain places too. They must have gotten them in there by accident, whoever built this before. And that's really stuck in there good. Ah, there it goes. Take these wires out from the ends with the screws. And now it's all disassembled and ready to work on. And wow, is this a huge motor. I'm gonna go ahead and hook up the motor right now and give it a quick test. So I'm curious to see if it's running properly. And it took right off. Current draw seems a bit high though. It's running pretty quietly though. I think I'll just have to do a bit of minor maintenance on it, some cleanup and oiling here and there, and it should run good as new. And to start on the motor's maintenance, I'll just take out the brushes here. The springs have some good tension on them. That's not coming out so easily. I might just have to unscrew the brush plate then. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to take the brush plate off of there. That's just two screws. Easy enough. And now I've got access to the rest of it. I see quite a bit of stuff in that commutator. So I'm guessing that is partly responsible for the high current draw. There's also just some crud I need to clean out. But that does turn very smoothly. I'm guessing it helps that that's a seven pole armature in there, not the usual five pole that you see in Pitman and other open frame motors. Very nice. Okay, so I just gave that a really quick wipe with the paper towel. It looks like someone put a bunch of grease in the commutator at some point. So that definitely would have gummed things up. I'm just cleaning out between the commutator plates using a knife. It's nicely between there. It's the dirt out without damaging the actual surface. And then for the rest of this junk in here, I'll just uh, grab a Q-tip or something and wipe it out with that. Yeah, that's looking much better. One more round with the paper towel. Just hold that against it. Turn the armature. And you can see the dirt that came off. Quite a bit being flung off the washer in there too. So this motor was definitely long, long overdue for a good cleaning. Since the commutator had so much grease on it, I'm also giving a quick wipe down to the brushes here to make sure they're clean. And I think you can see what a difference just a quick wipe down with a paper towel did for that thing. So I'll clean off the other one and I can work on putting this back together and seeing if the, if the performance is improved or not. That looks a lot better now. Amazing what you can do with a couple Q-tips and a little bit of alcohol. All reassembled. And one last thing I did was I made a slight adjustment to the spring tension on the brushes. I found they were a little too tight. And now it's running nice and smooth. And the current dropped from about 0.7 amps to 0.3 amps. So that's a pretty good running motor there. As long as I've got the motor out, I thought I'd do a quick comparison to the less expensive DC-90 that was made and developed by Hobbytown. So this here is the DC-90. It came out of the PA-1 kit that I made a few years back. It's a nice running motor. The construction of it is a little more sloppy or not really sloppy, just the tolerances aren't quite as tight as the DC-91, so it's a bit noisier, which you can hear there, compared to the DC-91, which turns very quietly. The magnet on the back is smaller, and it has a 5-pole armature instead of a 7-pole armature. 
The overall construction of it is also just a bit cheaper, lighter, and simpler too, so it's definitely understandable why it was a much less expensive option than the DC-91. I've also found that even though the DC-90 uses a bit less current when it's running free, it actually has a higher stall current than the DC-91. I think it was somewhere close to about 4 or 5 amps, but my power supply doesn't go that high, so I couldn't check for sure. They're both good motors, though. Very powerful. The DC-91 has a definite quality and performance edge over the DC-90, though, so this is definitely the best motor to get when you're looking at these old Hobbytown kits. And just for a quick noise comparison, I'll go ahead and run these real quick. The DC-90 is not a quiet motor. It's powerful though, runs well, and can maintain a fairly slow speed. So if you don't mind the noise and um, extra amp draw when it's stalled, which hopefully would never happen, it really is a good motor. And comparing it to the DC-91, make sure it's not touching the shaft there. Now because of the higher frequency of switching with the seven poles, it sounds like it's running faster than the DC-90, but they're actually going about the same speed. And for one more quick comparison, here's the motor that would come with the later E-Unit chassis. It is quite a bit smaller. And now that I'm done cleaning up the motor, it's time to move on to the gears. And these things are turning like that grease is made of gel or some kind of glue or something. It's not free at all, so those are definitely going to need some work. To start, I'm just wiping some of the worst of the stuff off using a paper towel. And then I can go a bit more in depth with it. That really is some thick grease that's on there. Well, I've got most of the grease cleaned off, so now I've just got the gears sitting in here. There's some alcohol that should hopefully help to dissolve a little extra. And then I'll use a brush to clean that up the rest of the way. And while that's soaking, I'll work on the tower here. Once again, Wipe off that nasty stuff. And the metal underneath still looks practically new. So this part really won't take much work. I will wanna go through these bearings with uh, something to get the grease inside of them cleaned out. Of course, I won't be able to get all of it, but fresh oil and running will help to clean that out over time and I can just keep on cleaning and re-oiling until it's uh, um, running as well as possible. I've given it some time to soak in alcohol. I don't know if that's loosened up the grease much, but I'm also putting some alcohol on the brush here. It's a pretty stiff one. And it seems to be getting all the crud out of there. In fact, there's quite a bit going on to the paper towel you can see, so I think a lot of this was pretty well dried up. So just keep on going at it until all the teeth look shiny and it should be all ready to go. And to finish this off I'm just uh, going over it real gently with the brass wire wheel since the gear itself is made of brass. This is taking out any harder particles left behind. And this should have it nice and clean. Well, those look a whole lot better than a few minutes ago. So, 
We'll go ahead and drop it back into the gear tower here. And the gear can actually coast now. Turns nice and free. Yeah, that takes absolutely no effort at all to turn those gears. Before I was having to grip the shaft pretty hard to get them to turn like you were seeing. So now, just needs a little oil. And I've got some oil in the bearings. Let's turn that in a bit. And like I mentioned before, there's probably some old grease and dirt left inside of there, so I'll have to oil it, clean it, and re-oil it a few times before it works just right. But this is definitely off to a good start. And now moving on to the trucks. Looks like these are going to need just as much cleaning as those other gears. So I'll pop that out and get started. Like all the other Hobbytown kits, they're just a couple screws on the bottom holding things together. On these older models, the axles actually sit in the side frames since these were also sold as the base of the dummy trucks, which to make it work as a dummy, you would just uh, mount these pieces the other way so it was uh, up here and then that would mount to the chassis. Get the wheels out, just loosen those screws a little. And out they go. And like the rest of it so far, everything in these trucks is completely coated with thick, sticky grease in every space possible. I even found some grease outside of the truck, so whoever lubricated this thing definitely overdid it. With a bit of experimentation, I've found some pretty good ways to really clean up and polish wheels. The first thing is to take the wheel off the axle, put it onto a motor with a shaft of the same size, Make sure that's turning smoothly, which it seems to be. So first, I'll just clean out a bit of grease using a Q-tip here. The grease even got into the wheel. <laughs> it really was not treated carefully. Okay, so now to take care of the wheel tread, I've got a pretty well used polishing wheel here, but it's got some life left. A bit of fine emery polish. Just get some of that onto there. Now, start this turning. And start polishing. Go at it gently. And look at that shine. I think I'll polish up the rest of the wheel too as much as I can. Then give that a clear coat around the untreaded area to preserve its shine. I couldn't really get into the inner area there with any sort of polishing wheel or other object, so instead I'll just be using the tip of this sanding pen gently. And just keep going at it until it looks nice and bright. That's a pretty good looking wheel there. So 11 more to go. So here's something I've never seen before on a Hobbytown axle. The grounded wheel is on this smaller part here, that which is a sixteenth of an inch. And then the insulated wheel is on this part of the axle, which is thicker at 3 seconds. So while I can put the insulated wheel on the motor, 
I have to find a different way to clean the grounded wheel. So, just so happens that Intermountain uses 16th inch axles for mounting their wheels, so I put that on there just temporarily. And then I will stick this into my lathe here. And then clean it the same way that I did with the other wheel on the motor. Kind of weird that cleaning is such a messy job, but the results are worth it. So there's the first truck cleaned up, or as clean as I could get it anyway. I could not believe just how much old grease was in there. Like I think most of that was the original grease from, from when this was built about 60, 65 years ago. And then they would just put a little bit of fresh oil on top of it. And then of course that would mix in with the old grease and turn into jello. So I had to scrape a lot of it out of there, like out of this part, out of the inside of here, cause it was just caked into there. And then a lot of brushing and alcohol and all that to get the gears and the uh, little bearings here clean. So just one truck to go, and then I can do some testing. Oh, and I think the polishing turned out pretty well on these wheels. Never be too shiny, right? Well, about 15 or 20 minutes of scraping, scrubbing, and doing whatever I could to clean this, and it's looking a whole lot better than it did before. So now just to get to work on these uh, wheels and side frames, then I can work on actually putting it back together and testing things out. All right, I gave them a quick cleaning, dried them off. Now I'm just gonna give them a quick shot of this uh, Krylon Crystal Clear to seal them and prevent tarnish, further tarnish of the brass. Just a thin coat is all they need. While the clear coat on the wheels is drying, I decided to go ahead and clean up the rest of the parts, at least as much as I could. So there's the chassis there looking a lot better than before. I got rid of the brush dust and grease and other things that, have fl that had flung out around there. And considering how thoroughly a lot of these parts were coated in yellow, I'm starting to think that maybe a lot of that was actually tobacco or something, but either way, it's cleaned up, looks a lot better. I've also reassembled the trucks with their axles so I can at least get them properly oiled, greased, and tested out. And everything seems to be working just fine. Gears are turning freely enough that I can do it by the shaft here which is exactly how you want it to be. One minor issue I found that I also had when I was building my PA1 a few years back is that the uh, mounting hole for the motor here hasn't been countersunk, so the metal in that area of the chassis is pretty thin. When you drop the screw in there, it sticks up just slightly which means that the motor can't fully be tightened down. So, what I did for the DC-90 motor when I had it installed in the PA was I just took a drill and went at it a little at a time until the hole had a better shape for fitting the screw. Just want to make sure none of those little particles can get into the motor, so I'm keeping a pretty tight grip around here. I think that'll be pretty good there. And the countersinking worked perfectly. The screw is nearly flush with the bottom there, which means the truck will have just a bit more clearance. And the motor has a tight fit to the chassis now without having to really crank down that screw too hard. When I was doing some initial testing before taking things apart, I found that this uh, pink tubing that had been put in there before is just way too soft for the torque of the DC-91. So I have this uh, 
heavy duty fuel line tubing from Tigon. And this has about the same flexibility as the black rubber tubing that Hobbytown used to provide. The only problem is that the hole is a little too large for these shafts, so what I'm doing is I'm uh, adding a little adapter piece onto the end of all these shafts using this eighth inch tubing. What I'm doing here is I'm just giving a little squeeze in a couple spots with cutting pliers. So it's got those little dimples in it. And then put it onto there. If I can. Yeah, this one's a little tight. There, get it started on there. And then just put it on something hard. And tap it down with a hammer. And that gives it a nice tight connection. Got the tubing in place. And that's working nice and smooth. And those trucks are both working just fine. So I think it's about time I bring those wheels back in and press them onto their axles. Of course, before I put the wheels back on, I want to get that clear coat off the tread, so one more quick run, turning these things. Just take the tip of a knife here. And that takes care of things real fast. All right, the wheels are all on, and that was a little tricky to do. I had to take out each axle, and then uh, I put this flywheel on one end, and then the large hole on this uh, um, F40 weight on the other end. Carefully put it all into my vise, and then press it on that way, and then the other insulated wheel I could just press on by hand. And that seems to have worked, so let's uh, see how this thing does on the track. Got it on the track. Let's see how it does. Off to a smooth start. Hmm. All right, looks like something derailed. Let's see what happened. There's a little wobble, but it seems to be doing better now. I traded a couple wheel positions around to try and smooth things out. And I also did a little bit of work on the bushings some of the axles sit in. And it seems to have helped. Now let's see how it does with the body. Alright, so the chassis just drops right into there. And there are two screws to hold it in place. And you don't want to get these screws tight in there. You only want to turn them until the head stops. So if you try to get them tighter than that, it'll actually bend the chassis inside of the body. And you don't want that. Okay, first test with the body on. Seems to be more stable with the body in place, so I guess that weight helps quite a bit. Well, there's still some wobble. Some further tuning should take care of that. That's full speed. It's using about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 amps, which is about what I would expect for one of these. 
found one of the biggest reasons behind the wobble was actually these bushings for the insulated wheels. A lot of them aren't actually drilled quite straight, so the wheels can have that kind of a motion while they're turning. So, I'm turning some new ones from this uh, plastic rod. I just cut off a piece, mounted onto this motor shaft, which is the same diameter as the axle, and then uh, just to slowly turn that down with a file or with the edge of a cutting wheel to get some of the major stuff at the beginning, and this seems to be working very well. All I have to do is press this into the wheel that needs it, and that'll smooth it out. Well, I only had to make a few bushings for the wheels, because not all of them were bad, so that should help it to run smoother. And I've also put the side frames back on to do some testing with those. And in order to prevent some short circuits, I actually had to press a few of the wheels on so they're a little bit narrow in gauge, but that shouldn't cause any problems on my track. And I also found that probably the biggest reason for the major wobble was the motor's magnet is powerful enough that a small screw had gotten sucked right into there between the truck and the magnet. And so it was just riding on there and moving around like that. Taking that out, smoothed it out quite a bit. I've also put the rear coupler back on. The rear of the engine, because of the large motor, was quite a bit heavier than the front. And since Hobbytown did offer that separate weight, I decided to cast my own. It should be about equal in weight to the one that they offered. But since it's lead, it was quite a bit smaller, so I was able to fit it underneath the drive shaft. And so it would take up a bit less room. Well, I've had it running around for a few minutes now. And even going through my terrible switches at high speed, it is having absolutely no trouble staying on the track. No derailments, no short circuits, or anything of the kind. It's also wobbling a whole lot less than before. The only detail part I was missing was the second horn for this thing. You can see the original here was a brass turning and they stuck a pin into there to mount it. So, I don't have any brass rod that large, but I do have plastic, so I turned this plastic one and inserted the original brass pin, which was still stuck in the roof. And although it's not quite perfect, I think that turned out very well. I'm using lacquer thinner and a toothbrush to take off the paint, and it is working really, really fast. So that is very nice. It'll only take me a few minutes to finish. That might have been the easiest paint stripping job I've ever had to do. The metal was well preserved underneath. I've got it all cleaned up. So I'll just pop off those brass railings so they can be reused later, and give this thing a fresh coat of paint. I've given this a good coat of paint, and I'll be decaling it for the New York Central. So I'll put those on, and then do some touch-up paint, add the details, and then get the finishing coat done. The cows wouldn't be so bad on a more modern model with uh, finer scale details, but the details on this one are very heavy, so this is going to take quite a bit of work to make these decals set down the way they really need to. So I'm just using a little solve a set at a time to soften them, conform to the details, and then I'll do more applications, get rid of any bubbles that may form here and there. And it should look good in the end. And I'm finally finished with the decals, and this is probably the most difficult decaling process I've ever had to go through. Not just because of the size of these stripes. I've done a New York Central paint scheme like this before and didn't have as much difficulty. But there's also some very deep, deep details to go around on here, which made it more difficult. I had to piece things together here and there, um, touch up certain areas with paint that I mixed to match the color of the decals. But in addition to all that, the decal sheet is probably about 15 years old. And even though it definitely would have fit in my mailbox, it was left outside in the rain for no reason. It's a miracle that they survived at all. So with all that in mind, I'd say this turned out pretty good. So I painted this for the number 4008, which was probably one of the only 
New York Central units to have the straight pilot instead of the more common inset pilot. And around the time that Hobbytown was manufacturing these, the 4008 had silver trucks with silver ladders painted to match, which was a little unique, so I painted this one to look the same way. So now we'll get on to clear coating, and this will be done and ready for review. While I wait for the clear coat to dry, I decided to wire in a headlight. So I put in these two little posts here to work as connectors. One of them has a diode on it. And then the light bulb here has a couple pieces of smaller tubing that will fit into the larger stuff here. So that way I can take the body off easily. Clear coat is on. Headlight is glued in place. So now it's time to get this thing back together. And it's all done. Considering that this was developed in the late 40s, Hobbytown's E7 really is a nicely detailed and well-scaled model that overall captures the appearance of the E7 diesels very well. It has more and finer detail than what you would have found on pretty much any of the other HO scale diesel products from around the same time. The ventilation along the sides is finely scaled and it has probably just about as many rivets along the sides as you would have found on the real engines. The roof detail is simple but also captures the appearance well and can be easily modified with some lift rings and other parts to make it look that much better. The nose and windshield area, like any other FRE unit made around that time, isn't exactly perfect but it is still quite a bit better than many others that I've seen from around that time. The trucks are also nicely scaled and well detailed, and by today's standards, they still look pretty good. When compared to a more modern model like the Proto 2000 E7 shown here though, you can pretty easily see that the details are mostly too thick or oversized in some way, so, it may not measure up well to today's standards of detailing, but it is still a good looking model overall. Probably the biggest inaccuracy on it would be the fuel tank area, which is pretty much just a couple of flat boards extending out from the fuel tank skirts. Now of course what you're really buying these for isn't the detail so much as the running quality and performance. And in that area, Hobbytown really was pretty much unbeatable at the time. As you've been able to see as I did the restoration of this thing, the overall construction of the thing is solid and heavy to give it plenty of traction. The all-metal gearing, as long as it's cleaned and well-maintained, will pretty much guaranteed last for the lifetime of the owner and even beyond that. And that huge DC-91 motor gives you all the torque you'll need to pull as long of a train as you want. As you can see here, it is pulling a string of cars that reaches all the way around my layout and right to the tip of the nose on this engine. And when it started up that train, it acted like there was nothing behind it at all. The current draw didn't increase more than about 50 milliamps from the free running current. Testing the speed of this thing, it reached about 110 scale miles per hour at 12 volts, which is almost dead on for the 109 miles per hour of the real E7 diesels. Running free, the current draw on average is about a half amp. Sometimes it drops to about 0.45 when it's on a straight, and it can go up to about 0.55 going around a curve. Now that sounds like a lot by today's standards, but back then, it was very common for motors to draw at least that much or even more than that running free. So this really was not only a powerful engine, but a very efficient one. Now the running quality, as long as you get it tuned right as you've seen, 
is very smooth. Now, some of those wheel insulators weren't exactly made perfectly, so that can definitely cause some wobble. So when that happens, you can do it like I did and turn some new insulators to replace the original ones, and that can help with the performance. Or the other option would be to replace the wheels with new ones that do turn perfectly. Speaking of the wheels, the only version of the Hobbytown E7 that had the correctly sized 36 inch wheels was the original one. Starting with this model and all versions afterwards, they've come with 40 inch wheels, which are of course too large for the E7. So if you want to replace those wheels with some correctly scaled 36 inch ones, I found that Intermountain 36 inch freight car wheels are a good replacement for the grounded ones on here. And then for the insulated ones, if you have a later chassis that has the 16th inch axle on both sides, you can also use the Intermountain insulated wheels there. You just have to file the backs off of those wheels a little so that you can get them gauged properly. For this one though, the Intermountain wheels would only be able to fit one side, and then a different wheel such as uh, maybe insulated wheels from Northwest Shortline could be fit to the other side. So there could be a slight mismatch of appearance, but as long as you don't mind that, or as long as you paint them, it's no problem at all. So overall, the Hobbytown E7 really is a very nice model. The body is well scaled and nicely detailed for its age. It's got that classic Hobbytown chassis that's going to run forever as long as you take care of it. And the all-metal construction combined with that huge DC-91 motor is going to give it all the power it's ever going to need to pull the longest trains possible.